Welcome to the MacArthur Memorial Podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Williams. Join me as we explore the life and legacy of General of the Army Douglas MacArthur and discuss a wide range of military history topics from the American Civil War to the Korean War. This is part two of a two-part series on Ernie Pyle. Well, he does end up back in Italy. And as you said, you know, it's still a difficult time for him. But there's at w- one point in Italy where he really reaches a very, very low point, And he is doubting his talent as a writer. And it's right around this time, though, that he writes probably what's his most famous column. Mm-hmm. So tell us the story behind this. Yes. So you're referring to uh, a column that was titled The Death of Captain Waskow. And this is a really, I mean, it's for sure his most famous piece. Um, In fact, there was an organization that voted it the best column written in the 20th century by an American. And it's one of those columns that any sort of World War II buff is likely to have read or is likely to have even heard parts of it. And when I do book talks or I do signings or whatever, like someone will always say like, oh, I remember when I first read Captain Waskow, right? It really, it has that that kind of effect on people. And so the way he found this story was was sort of serendipitous. He was covering a battle at a a little ancient village in Italy called San Pietro. And this was a very uh, difficult battle. The Germans had uh, taken control of this mountain that was right above the village. They were in control of the village. So they sort of, they had the the um, high ground and the low ground and they were in a defensive position. So everything, um, basically every inch had to be fought for and including this mountain. And so Ernie shows up, he's at the bottom of the mountain. The fighting is fierce. And he's in that, again, just sort of fly on the wall kind of mode where he's just hanging around at this aid station that's in sort of the back of the lines near where the army stores all of the uh, donkeys that they use to get supplies up and down the mountain. So you can imagine the, the scenario here where it's mucky and muddy and stinks and there's, you know, animals and the smell of an aid station and and medicine and blood and and Ernie's just kind of sitting there hoping something's going to happen and he meets this young soldier who has trench foot and he's getting treatment for a trench foot and they get to talking and this young soldier tells him hey you know I if you're going to write a column uh, why don't you write one about my captain he just was killed but he saved my life and he was the best friend I ever had sort of a statement. And so Ernie's like, oh, okay, this might be an interesting story. Well, where is your captain? Well, he's still up on the mountain. Well, this young soldier starts telling him all these different stories about Captain Waskow. And he there's this one story in particular where they had been out, um, you know, fighting in the mountains in Italy, and it was Thanksgiving, and they were, you know, in the in the rear, and they had been promised a, a Thanksgiving feast as a you know morale booster and by the time Waskow's men got to the um the camp they had run out of food supposedly and so the cook was basically saying hey sorry you know the kitchen's closed and the the way the story goes is Waskow sort of slowly slides his hand down his torso to the grip of his of his sidearm and sort of you know gives the look of like are we really going to have a problem here and all of a sudden the cooks is like, okay, okay, we'll open the we'll open the kitchen back up. And and so like Waskow had this reputation where like he would do anything for his men. And and he also um would never ask them to do something that he wasn't willing to do. And he would never send them on a patrol that he wasn't gonna be sort of the lead element on. And that was just that was his style. Well, sort of halfway through the battle, Waskow is supposed to lead his men down this, this little scree on the side of the mountain, and all of a sudden, German artillery hits them. Waskow pushes this young soldier out of the way, takes a you know big piece of shrapnel right to the chest, falls down dead. This is a couple of days later. Ernie's hearing all this story, and he's like, you know, thinking to himself, this, this might be, you know, the subject of a really great column. And 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 of course, I mean, it sounds very heroic, and you know, these soldiers love this captain and and it has all the ingredients of a great story. 
but you gotta put yourself back in late 1942, early 1943, where you cannot write about a individual soldier being killed in combat, right? That is not seen as appropriate. That's the, the fear is that this is going to upset the morale back home, right? Yes, we can talk about the numbers of casualties. We can say people were killed, but we don't tell stories of individual soldiers and how they died. Ernie hears the story of Captain Moscow, and I don't know if you know something profound came over him or what it was, but this column essentially becomes the first piece of uh, journalism that details the specific death of a specific soldier and names that soldier. And this is a real turning point in, in journalism at that point. And this is also at the same point where the the censors and the censorship offices, both overseas and back home, are starting to see discussions of you know, military losses and casualties as necessary to show like how much more hard work is needed on the home front in order to support the war. Whereas early in the war, the fear was, you know, if we talk about individual losses, it's going to be really bad for morale and we won't be able to sell this war, right? We won't be able to keep the American people believing that this is worth the cost. So for Ernie to write about this individual soldier is a really, really important moment. Well, the, the problem was that they couldn't retrieve Waskow's body. A day went by, a second day went by, a third day went by. Well, finally, that young soldier that Ernie met, he decides he's going to go up there on his own and he's going to go get Waskow's body with, um, with one of the donkeys. And later on, he comes back and as he's bringing Waskow's body down the mountain, he's hit by a piece of shrapnel from, from a mortar round or from an artillery shell. He's wounded. He's, he's got his dead captain strapped to the donkey and, and they're, you know, coming down the trail and Ernie watches as basically like the men around that area sort of light up and it's like, oh, this is, this is Captain Waskow. This is our captain. And they lay Waskow's body down and it's along this stone fence and Ernie watches over the course of about five or 10 minutes as Waskow's men each individually come and pay their last respects to to their beloved captain and he captures all of this in the column and even just like talking about right now i get chills you know down the back of my neck i i i have this sort of visceral response to this story and i think you know a lot of readers at the time did as well to the point where um waskow's family started receiving letters from all over the country of condolence of offering sympathy of of offering you know anything to try to ease the burden of of their loss that was that was because that was the first time anybody had had done that had had really humanized and put put this individual human face on on war on loss on on casualties right so Waskow, you could argue would even sort of be a stand in for all the the men and women who were lost right that suddenly they were all humanized in this way and and you mentioned like this is a time where ernie is basically not communicating or not in communication with jerry her mental health is deteriorating his is deteriorating unlike in north africa he's able to find alcohol to drink in Italy. Um, he goes on several benders and he's really using alcohol to deal with everything that's going on. And then he writes the column about Captain Waskow. And there's this very famous exchange that he has with a very good friend of his named Don Whitehead, who is a, also a correspondent and, and a, a wonderful correspondent. And he says, here, can you read this column? I, I think I am about washed up. Like, I just can't do this anymore. I don't belong here anymore. You know, I, I don't have anything new or interesting to say. And Don Whitehead reads the draft of Captain Waskow and he looks up at Ernie and he says, Ernie, if, if this is evidence that you're washed out, then the rest of us need to go home because this is, this is the best thing that I've, that anyone's read or that anyone's written. And so, you know, the column goes home. It's published all over the country. And at that time, there was a movie producer who was interested in doing a movie about Ernie based on the columns that Ernie had written from North Africa. And then when he read Captain Waskow, he said, wait a minute, the movie has to take place in Italy it, because we need to have this character in the movie. Um, right. So like this, this is one of those really, again, pivotal moments in Ernie's career where 
where his fame just explodes on top of the explosion from North Africa, on top of the explosion from England. You know, he he's getting more and more and more famous and the demands on him are becoming greater and greater and greater. The requests for him to do things are becoming greater and greater and greater. He's getting letters from people all over the country who want him to track down their brother or their son or their father or to find out how their son died or or was injured or whatever it was. And all of that is just taking this huge psychic toll on him. And then on top of that, he finds out that he's suffering from anemia. So like, I, you know, of course he's totally exhausted and burned out and frayed and, you know, needing to, to supplement himself with alcohol. It's like his body's literally shutting down and he's got so many close calls. He ends up going to Anzio. Um, Anzio was a, a really precarious place to be. Um, he was in a, in a home, got up from bed to smoke a cigarette. 500 pound bomb landed 30 feet away from the house blew the room apart it would have killed him if he had still been in bed you know he's got all these close calls and and he's thinking to himself well i don't want to get killed in italy if i'm going to get killed i want to get killed invading europe and so it was at that point where he decided no more italian campaign for him he was going to go to england and get ready for the invasion can you describe that experience at normandy Oh, absolutely. So Ernie had been selected. Um, I believe the number was 28. They were going to have 28 correspondents who were going to participate in the invasion. This was seen as a great honor to be chosen uh, to cover the invasion. And Ernie was totally petrified. Now, if you recall, I said, you know, he didn't really like going on invasions. He would prefer to skip invasions if he could. But now he's being told, no, you're going to go on this invasion and you're going to cover it from the from the actual front. And so he, you know, boards the ship. He is trying to psych himself up for the the eventual, you know, climb down the ladder uh, into the uh, into the Higgins boat and the, you know, drive to the beach with the tracers and the mortar rounds and artillery shells and everything. He's like trying to mentally get ready for it. And then the ship that he's on has some kind of engine malfunction and it drifts out of the convoy that it's in. And for a little while, they were sort of out of control and drifting towards, you know, basically the German held beach um, up the coast from Normandy. And now Ernie's thinking to himself, well, I'm going to get captured and I'm going to be a prisoner of war. Because that's we're going to land on this beach and the Germans are going to are going to take us prisoner. Then they get the engine fixed. If you can tell, Ernie was a little bit of a worry wart. He he sort of always was anticipating what could go wrong. So then the the ship is is righted itself. It's it's moving back into the convoy, but it missed its place. So now the invasion takes place with Ernie watching from the shore. He doesn't actually land on D Day. He thinks he's missed the story of the century. He thinks that, you know, you know, he's relieved that he didn't have to experience the invasion, but he's also knows that he's going to be criticized or, or people are going to feel disappointed that he didn't actually participate. The next day he lands on the beach. He finds Don Whitehead. He finds a couple other correspondents that he was close with, realizes that they got through it okay. He's feeling good about that. By that point, the fighting has moved a couple of miles inland. He can hear all the explosions. There's still German planes that fly over and strafe the beaches. But for the most part, the combat operations on the beaches are over. And he's in that place where he's just going, well, I missed it, you know. And and also at the same time, it's this invasion of totally gigantic proportions, right? I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ships, you know, thousands and thousands of troops. You know, all the aircraft in the sky, like everything is just so overwhelming that he was he was not sure how he was going to possibly capture all of it and how he was going to convey this to the American people. From the beach, he goes back onto a ship. He's got to type up a series of columns on D-Day. And these, I think, you know, Captain Waskow is is for sure his most famous column. But my favorite columns are the series from D-Day. And basically what he does for the third piece in the series is he walked along 
the beach of Normandy where the ocean hit the sand. And he cataloged all of the personal effects that he found floating in the water. And it was not, you know, of course there were helmets and bayonets and grenades and web belts and all the sort of military gear, but he also found pocket Bibles. He found cigarettes, he found toothbrushes, he found razors, he found letters that were postmarked for some place in the United States that would never be sent and, and whoever wrote them would, would never go home again. And he just walked along the beach for about half a mile taking in this, this, this site. And when he sat down to write the piece, I have to imagine that the way that he figured out how to write about the greatest invasion in human history was not to write about the greatest invasion in human history. It was to write about the six feet in front of his face, looking down at the beach. And when you read the piece, you, you start to realize the previous owners of all those things, right, are no longer with us. And that was the real cost of the invasion. The real cost was, was these individual human lives. And again, he finds that way to bring the war, this huge worldwide war, from the 30,000 foot view down to this, this microcosm, down to the specific, and really humanize something that's otherwise very difficult for people back home to understand or to to be able to picture. And so uh, when he writes this series, you know, he was very self-deprecating. He was like, well, you know, I did the best I could, but I'm sure people are going to be disappointed. And then it's like, again, read all over the country, read on the radio, read into the um, uh, into the congressional record, uh, used in war bond advertisements, like the whole country goes crazy for this series. And he again um, has this sort of explosion of fame, but now it's at the level where all the soldiers are recognizing him too. So not only can, you know, he he used to be able to sort of disappear into the army, but now in Normandy, in, in Northern France, everywhere he goes, soldiers recognize him, they know who he is, they read his column for years. They want to be subjects in his column. General Bradley even says at one point that his units fought better in France when Ernie was with them because they wanted to be written up in a positive way by Ernie Pyle. I mean, he takes on this like this mythic kind of level once he's he's in northern France. And when he's in northern France, he's also experiencing the worst fighting um, that he experienced as a correspondent. And I think, you know, at least this was true for me, my kind of high school, college, uh, American history, if it covered D-Day at all, you know, made it seem like, yes, the fighting was really tough, but then eventually, you know, the Allied wave, you know, pushes the Nazis all the way back to Germany and the wars, you know, oh, and then we have the Battle of the Bulge and then the war's over. But when you really study the Normandy campaign, it was vicious. It was brutal. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans died. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Germans. Whole uh, villages wiped out. Thousands and thousands of French civilians killed. Um, you know, just and and that was something that I really felt you know was a was a palpable thing when I was in northern uh, France when I was in Normandy. And in fact, one person I interviewed said, well, everybody knows somebody who was killed in the war. Everybody knows somebody who has an uncle who was in the resistance, right? Everybody knows somebody whose grandfather was, was taken from France and, and put in a forced labor camp in Germany. I mean, they, they felt the war at a, at a level that I don't think is always clearly understood by, by Americans. And so when I was doing that research and reading about Ernie and, and seeing how, how the war was, was really affecting him at that point, you know, you can start to feel the exhaustion in his writing. You can start to feel how frustrated he is. You can start to feel how much his depression is influencing the way he's seeing things. And it's not until the liberation of Paris where he sort of has this realization that like, oh, the war could end at some point, right? The world could experience life without war. And maybe this is kind of what it would be like. 
And then there was this retaliatory raid. The Germans bombed um, parts of Paris after the liberation. And Ernie, that was when he really reaches a breaking point. He uh, tells his bosses he's done. He's not covering the war anymore. He's not going to go into uh, Belgium or Holland. He's not going to Germany. He He's seen too many dead people. He's wrung out. Um, he can't sleep. He can't stand it anymore. And he decides that he has to go home. And this is in late August, early September, um, 1944. And he even writes a column to his readers saying, I'm done up. I just can't do this anymore. I've been at war for so long. I've been at the front lines for so long. I need a break. I can't do it anymore. But then he leaves the door open and he says, but who knows, you know, perhaps a little time in New Mexico with my wife will give me back the vim and the vigor that I need to go war horsing off to the Pacific. And um, uh, so, so Ernie leaves France. He returns to the United States. Again, he's incredibly famous. Uh, two different universities want to grant him honorary doctorates. He's got offers to speak all over the country, but at the same time, Jerry's mental health is deteriorating and it gets to the point, her lowest point, um, where she attempts suicide in a very vicious way, um, very bloody way. And Ernie thinks that, you know, that's pretty much it. Like that's the culmination of their relationship. It was always going to end that way. But miraculously, she doesn't die and she needs to be institutionalized, the doctors say. And so Ernie's now in this place where he doesn't want to be famous anymore. He doesn't care that he's rich. He spends most of his money on buying war bonds. Um, and he can't spend any time with his wife because she's institutionalized and home doesn't feel like home. Um, so he decides to go off to the Pacific to cover the war there. The Navy was also very insistent um, that he go to the Pacific and try to raise the notoriety of the Pacific theater. That was one thing I found really interesting in my research was how much more coverage the European theater received over the Pacific theater. And so a lot of, you know, higher ups in the Navy thought that if Ernie was in the Pacific, then the American public would focus more on the Pacific. But Ernie sort of has the same reaction to the Navy um, in the Pacific that he had in uh, in Sicily in the Mediterranean, where he writes about how soft their experiences are, how, you know, the worst thing that happens to them is that they get homesick or, you know, they have they have all these delights and all these privileges and all these advantages that the soldiers in the European theater do not share. And this really riles up folks in the Pacific. You know, you got to imagine like er by the time Ernie gets to the Pacific, he doesn't know about Guadalcanal. He doesn't know about these major battles, these incredibly bloody and costly battles that have taken place and like how much you know, blood has been shed and and how much fighting there really has been. And then factor in the Pacific naval fight against the Japanese and, you know, kamikaze pilots. And, you know, I mean, the whole, there was nothing soft about the Pacific theater. Um, but Ernie writes about it. I think, you know, this is also a man whose life has turned out very differently than he had hoped it would. And I, and I think maybe some of that bitterness uh, leached into to some of his reporting. And at the same time, he started feeling like, you know, just going from ship to ship and going from rear island base to rear island base was not giving him anything interesting or exciting to write about. Because, again, he didn't think that their experiences were very interesting. He kind of lost that reporter's curiosity, you could say. So he decides that he's going to go along on an invasion finally, and he's going to go with the Marines because he's heard lots of stories about Marines, but he doesn't know any Marines. Um, so he's going to go with the Marines on the invasion of the island of Okinawa. Now, the Battle of Okinawa turns into a 90-day absolute slaughter, one of the worst, bloodiest battles in the Pacific. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people killed on all sides. And Ernie's going to go along on the invasion with the Marines, thinking... If he, if he lives through this invasion, this is the, the one and only invasion he's ever going to go on. And he if, if he survives, he's going to take it easy for the rest of the war. He doesn't care if people think his writing is dull. He makes a promise to Jerry that he's going to come home after the Okinawa invasion. This buoyed her spirits reportedly. 
And what Ernie finds is the same thing the Marines found, which was that the Japanese did not defend the beaches at Okinawa. So the one invasion that Ernie decided to go on was the one invasion that was basically uncontested. So he picked, you know, a really good one to go on, but not if he was hoping to have that experience finally of, you know, being under the, the heavy bombardment and the machine gun fire and everything else. So he goes along with the Marines along the northern half of the island for a few days. Most of the fighting is in the southern half of the island. So he's kind of going on patrols. He sees some Japanese prisoners. He writes about the Okinawan people. He writes about the weather, you know, pretty standard stuff. But again, doesn't see a lot of fighting and decides that that's a sign he should be done reporting now. He goes back onto his ship, uh, which was not a totally safe thing to do because of kamikaze attacks during the Battle of Okinawa. But he's on a ship and he writes a letter back home to Jerry saying that that was it, that that was the last invasion, the last time he would go into combat. But then a few days later, um, he decides to go ashore on this tiny island that's off the coast of Okinawa. And it's there where he is ultimately killed. One of the, one of the questions that I get a lot is, well, if he if he wrote this letter saying he was done, that he was not going to cover combat anymore, why did he go to that little island? Why did he why did he get killed? And the best interpretation or the best speculation, I should say, that I have here is to agree with what another correspondent named Robert Sherrod said. So Robert Sherrod was on the same ship with Ernie. And he said, after Ernie was killed, he said, I don't know who convinced him to go along, but I guarantee it was a soldier because Ernie never said no to a soldier. So that, I think, makes the most sense where, you know, he wrote this letter to Jerry saying like, hey, I'm done. That's it. I'm coming home. Right. And then someone said, hey, Ernie, come along with us. We're going to go on this little island and we're going to see something or another. And even at that moment, right, even after he had promised his wife that he was done, he still just couldn't say no to a soldier. I think that makes the most sense for what happened. But at the same time, Ernie is not really in the right frame of mind to be going into a combat zone. And I, the evidence I have for that is that when he lands on this tiny little island, he is wearing his tan uniform. The only people who wore tan uniforms were officers. So a Marine said, you can't wear that <laughs> in the jungle. You'll, you'll stand out like a sore thumb. So he threw this kind of jungle coat over Ernie. They also, uh, there's reporting that Ernie was wearing a cap that made it look like he was an officer. And he was wearing aviator sunglasses, which were, again, things that only officers wore. He's also in his 40s. So he's the age of, you know, some senior officer. And he hitches a ride in a Jeep with three other soldiers. And the Jeep is in this small convoy and they're going along the edge of the island. And all of a sudden, a Japanese machine gun position opens up on the Jeep. The four men pile out of the Jeep. Ernie and another soldier duck into this little uh, ditch next to the road. And a few seconds later, another burst of machine gun fire um, towards Ernie's position. Uh, comes out of the tree line and the soldier that was with him turns and looks and Ernie is laying on his back with a trickle of blood coming out of his mouth and he's unresponsive. And so that's the story that's told to the American public. And in fact, there was one detail that was added, which was that Ernie had poked his head up and asked about whether everyone was okay and that that's when he was killed. Now, the pictures that were taken of Ernie's body don't necessarily confirm that story. And again, I have to wonder if it was just like the time and the context of wanting to sort of tell a clean version of what had likely happened, right? It sounds Hollywood-esque, you could say, of like, hey, is everyone okay? And boom, lights out, right? What might have happened and what I think based on the pictures happened was that Ernie actually was laying in the ditch with his back to the machine gun. So he's, you got to imagine he's kind of slouching down in the ditch. His back is to the road. And right above where he had been, had his body pressed up to the road, it looked like a half moon shape of dirt was missing. And so what some people have argued is that the machine gun rounds went through the dirt and hit Ernie in the back of the head 
and that they sort of spun him or the, his body spun around and fell backwards. But that's why there's no bullet hole on the front of his head is because the bullets sort of lost some of their trajectory going through the dirt and the bullets stayed in his head. Now, why do I tell all those details? Well, it's, it's to show partly what sort of mythic status Ernie had had risen to, to where even his death had to be narrated just so, right? And it had to be it had to be heroic and it had to be sort of worthy of someone like Ernie Pyle. And, you know, I'm not calling anybody a liar. I'm not, you know, I totally understand how there can be, you know, confusion and the fog of war and you can think something happened. But part of me has to wonder, you know, what frame of mind Ernie was in where he's dressed like an officer, he's calling attention to himself. And in the the picture of his body, he's back in his tan uniform. So at some point he took that coat off. Did he have a death wish? Maybe. Did he not care anymore if something happened to him? Maybe. I've also talked to veterans who say, you know, sometimes people just get complacent. You know, they've been in it for so long that they don't think about those things and they make a mistake and and then it's over. Maybe it was a combination of all those things. Um, but that Ernie Ernie was killed. He was basically sainted at that point. He became, became the patron saint of, of war correspondence. There's a whole generation of Vietnam era correspondents who who wrote later that they became correspondents because they read Ernie Pyle growing up. I talked to lots of correspondents who covered the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan who said they were partly inspired by Ernie's reporting or that they knew that they had to get that on the ground, you know, what Ernie called the worm's eye view of the war. They had to embed, they had to get with the troops to be able to tell those stories. Those were all inventions of Ernie Pyle, right? Telling the story of an individual soldier and tracing their life and how it's ended. Like that was pioneered by Ernie Pyle. It's it's almost impossible to talk about being a war correspondent without his name coming up. And and so, you know, one thing that I found really fascinating, I wanted to write a book about Ernie Pyle for years. And my agent told me, he said, you know, I just don't know if if people will necessarily remember Ernie Pyle. You know, some people will and definitely journalists will. But, you know, do, does the average person remember Ernie Pyle? And so we came up with this idea that I should kind of test the waters and write an article about Ernie Pyle. And I was working as a columnist for the New York Times at the time, and they were looking for an article to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. And I said, I got this great idea. I tell you the Ernie Pyle story. It's a great story. And they loved it. They loved the pitch. Um, so I wrote the story. And I was told later that once the story was published, within the first day, it had over a million views, which like broke all these records that the, that the column had at the time. And it was also read by my editor, uh, the, the man who edited this book. He read that article and reached out to me and said, hey, I love this article. If you ever want to write a book about Ernie Pyle, let me know. So my agent, I'm not going to name him because I don't want him to feel embarrassed, but my agent was a little off on the market in terms of Ernie Pyle in the United States. And for the last you know, four or five years, I get oh, at least two or three emails or letters a month of people who found something I wrote online or they found my book or they were doing research about, you know, their father or their grandfather and Ernie Pyle came came up somehow because Ernie wrote all their names down. All the soldiers that he met, he included their names. Sometimes he included their addresses in the columns that he wrote because he, again, wanted to really humanize the war. And people felt like they knew him. They, they, you know, the University of Indiana, Indiana University, sorry, um, where his archive is, they have a whole section of archive that's just photo albums and like article albums, uh, scrapbooks that people made with Ernie's columns. And then after he was killed, they were like, what do we do with this? Let's you know, send it to to the university where his archive is like. I had a Google alert set up for Ernie Pyle, and one of the most common things that would pop up on there is someone would pass away, and in their obituary, it would say that they were written about by Ernie Pyle, or that their unit was written about by Ernie Pyle, or that they were on the same ship as Ernie Pyle. Like, it became major milestones in people's lives 
to have been written about by him or or to have known him. And and I think after all the years of you know reading his his columns, reading his letters, um, reading his his diary entries, the the thing that I walk away with is that he never fully appreciated what really made him special and what made him good at what he did. And so I don't think he for a second ever really enjoyed it and, and didn't, you know, believe that it was that it was the the thing that he was put on the earth to do. Everything was felt like, you know, this burden that he had to shoulder. And I'd be lying if I didn't, you know, take some personal lessons away from, you know, the kind of like work-life balance and, you know, mental health balance or imbalance. Um, that Ernie exhibited through his life and the choices that he made and the the commitments that he made, you know, it does, I think, raise really interesting questions about who is who are you responsible for? Who do you have a duty to? Right. What happens when you're when your wife needs you, but also the country needs you? Right. How do you how do you navigate that? Um, and like I said, I don't think Ernie always navigated it um, totally effectively, but but it does, I think, resonate with readers today who are struggling with tragedy, struggling with grief, struggling with a work-life balance, struggling with, you know, any sort of kind of conflict between different goals or different ideals. Um, I think that's, again, the, the kind of thing that is universal in this very specific story. And that's what Ernie did with his reporting. He told universal stories with really specific details. Well, he's an absolutely fascinating figure. I think even for people who are maybe not interested in World War II, just a really incredible life, very difficult life. But as you said, there's a lot to learn from his story. And he left us just an incredible legacy in terms of his writing and in terms of, I think, even how we view service members today. So thank you very much for sharing your research on Pile with us. And um, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. This was this was fun. It's always fun to talk about him. Thank you for listening. If you have questions, suggestions, or comments, we want to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at MacArthur1880, on Facebook as the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial, or you can email MacArthurMemorial at Norfolk.gov.